economy that will continue to produce more and more young working age people in the world for a long time to come. And even China will not be able to match that. Finally, I think the global shocks. I don't think any one of us could have predicted, going back to predictions, that oil will be where it is today. I think today we are about $30. I think about 20, 21 months ago it was $110. So we are down by more than 70%. And I think every day, and the jury is out on whether we have hit the bottom. And I think the same we've seen in commodities. And I think it is disrupting countries. It is disrupting companies. And I think we have to understand what the implications of these forces are. I think today it's a benefit, it's a benefit to us as a country for every dollar the price is lower. India saves about a billion dollars, but, uh, but uh, this is also the reason why many other countries like Russia and Brazil today are in the deep doldrums. So we live in times where there are some massive forces at work, many of which I'm sure 20 years from now we will look back and say, shit, how did we get that wrong so badly? But what I wanted to briefly touch upon is, so what are the implications of this for business? I'll touch on this briefly, but then I want to spend more time on what does it mean for us as leaders? So first, I'd say for business, I think where to compete choices are much, much more important than how to compete choices. You know, our research over the last decades shows that following the mega trends, betting on where the trends are behind you and riding the tailwinds. If you look at what the IT industry did over the last 20 years, it arguably was riding on the tailwind of global disruption driven by technology costs coming down, telecommunication costs coming down was a very, very big mega trend. So we think where to compete choices is much, much more important than how to compete choices. So think hard about your portfolio, about your segments, and think very granularly about where you want to compete. Second, what I call dynamic resource allocation. This is a big challenge for companies because we often don't want to exit anything. But I think one thing we've learned is the companies that have survived and thrived in every crisis are the ones that have been nimble to shift resources from one business to the other from one business unit to the other and make radical changes year on year and not be stuck by inertia. So that's the second implication. The third implication for business is you've got to become a serial deal maker. This is not a choice. When we analyze the fastest growing companies in the world over decades, more than half of their growth has been driven by m and It's empirical evidence. Most people are not good at it. But it's a, it's, it's a science that can be learned. The fourth implication in my mind is agility. And we, when I say agility, I mean both speed and stability. The challenge we have in many organizations today is that they can be very stable, but are they able to move fast enough when things around them change? So we are, organizationally, we are caught in the, oftentimes in the systems, the policies, the bureaucracy, which is not in tune with the rate at which the market expects us to move. So how do you build agility? Fifth, not surprisingly, I think this comment was made earlier, I think every business is getting digitally disrupted today. Only yesterday I was talking to a CEO of a cement company and he was saying that, look, we can talk about innovation and, and so forth in a core business, but what I'm most excited about is really how do I use technology to actually get all the key constituents, whether it's the construction companies, whether it's the consumers connected, and I think his view is that actually that company that I'm about to incubate is gonna be more valuable than my core cement business that my grandfather started. And finally, I think the challenge of leadership is not just a technical one. I think while we do need technical leadership, I think the world we live in today, the challenge of leadership is an adaptive one. And many problems that we think of as technical problems are actually really management and adaptive leadership problems. So with this in background, I want to touch on very quickly eight key points about what does it mean for leaders individually. You know, if you were a CEO of a company, if you were a senior leader in an organization, what does it mean for you personally? So I want to talk about first what leaders do, then talk about who leaders are, and finally how leaders interact. And I'm going to do this very briefly. So first point I want to talk about is need a telescope and a microscope. So what I mean by that is if you're a leader today, I think on one hand you need a telescope to see where the world is going to be 20 years from now. So what does it mean to be in emerging markets? What does it mean to be when half of the companies that are going to be born in the world will be from emerging markets. How do I capture into that $34 trillion consumption that's going to happen in the emerging markets? How do I look at new business models that are going to be disrupted by digital? 
On the other hand, how do I have a microscope to look at how am I performing this month, this quarter, this week? And how do I deal with the risk that I'm faced with today? And that, I think, is a major, major challenge for senior leaders because some of them inherently tend to be either too short-term or others tend to be too long-term. So how do you get this ability to have both a microscope and a telescopic vision as you lead the business? Second, I think the trend breaks. You know, I think uh, the reality is that we don't know what are those three sigma events that could unfold that could dramatically disrupt my business. We talked about commodity price swings. You know, we talked about, for example, technology. You know, what would be the second order effect in the U.S. of driverless cars? Does that mean fewer accidents, fewer organ donors? And will that change the market for heart surgery? Now, just think about that. Think about the second and third order implications of driverless cars and what that would do to the healthcare business. Or think about the supply disruptions happening in Japan and what that would do to the automotive supply chain in the U.S. And how do you plan for that? How do you model that? So I think it's important to invest in planning for what I call not just the obvious scenarios, but the tail scenarios. Consider the second and third order effects of what will happen to your business. Think about how you might want to shift resources. You know, our research suggests that what matters in strategy increasingly is riding those tailwinds and then making what we call big moves. You know, where can you double down? Where can you triple down? If you look at the Indian pharmaceutical industry, for example, that has created enormous wealth. One of the reasons it has created that enormous wealth is because they've doubled down on the US. And majority of the money has been made in the US, while others have frittered their energy by competing in many, many markets. So I think there's an important implication about thinking about what those tail trends could be, and therefore, how do I adjust my strategy and resources for that? Third. It's interesting, when you ask CEOs, you know, how much do you invest? You know, how important it is to increase investment and leadership development? You know, 90% agree, of course, we need to. If you ask them what percent of companies have high confidence in their current approach to leadership development, you find only one third. If you ask them, what do you think are the strongest predictors of leadership effectiveness outcomes? Increasingly, what we find is when we map leadership requirements with record of growth and so on, we find that three things stand out, and they're pretty obvious, by the way. One is problem solving. Problem solving capability because you're dealing with problems all the time. That's a very, very important number one requirement to be an effective leader. Number two is quality decision making. Quality decision making, so how decisive are you in this environment? Number three is what I call supportive leadership and being able to being open to other people's perspectives and being able to get the best out of your team. Number four, I'm wanting to talk now about what, uh, who leaders are. And the point I wanted to emphasize here is a strong sense of purpose. You know, this is a chart borrowed from Simon Sinek's research. And he has this interesting golden circle where he, he talks about if you go into an organization and ask them what do you do, you know, most people can tell you what they do. You know, I, I make motorcycles, I make scooters, I make tires, whatever. If you ask them, how do you do it? You know, many people in the organizations can also answer, you know, we are great at supply chain. I was talking to you earlier, and you were saying it's an operator's, you know, it's an operation's dream to be at Mother Dairy, so how do you do it? But if you ask people, why do you do it? That's the toughest question. I think in most organizations, that's the question that most people struggle to answer. And I think it's very important to really define what I call a sense of purpose for the organization. That's hard to do. Many times in founder-led businesses, it happens because the founder wants to do it and people follow him. But the challenge is if the founder isn't there, people also lose a sense of purpose. So part of the reason I think is if you go into a company like Apple, the reason it's so successful is partly I think because people, they feel like they have a missionary purpose. You know, they're not trying to make phones. They're, they feel like they're trying to change the world. Right? And how do you figure out what that sense of purpose is you know, for people in your organization? Fifth, I want to talk about calm decision making. It is estimated that on average, we all as human beings make about 10,000 decisions a day. Starting from what time we wake up, what do we, how, when we brush our teeth, when we have breakfast, you know, da, 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 you can go on and on. 
thankfully, majority of them are pretty inane decisions, but it's important to identify the big ones. You know, there's a very interesting quote from Barack Obama. He says, you need to focus your decision-making energy. You know, I get rid of all the clothes I have except for gray suits and blue suits, so I don't have to think about what I put on. And the point he's making is I want to preserve my energy for really the big decisions that matter. It's because in today's world, I need to be able to compartmentalize, I need to be able to focus. So what are those few big decisions that you need to make that will change the course or the trajectory of your business? And do, how do you make sure that you remain focused on putting disproportionate amount of energy in those and not all the other trivial choices? Sixth, I want to talk about as leaders, how do you balance expectations of your stakeholders with your own convictions? You see, one of the realities is that if you're a CEO or a serial leader leading a company today, there are a lot of people who have expectations from you. You know, if you're in a government regulated business, the government has expectations or constraints. The regulators will change things. The board wants you to do something or not do something. Your employees and the team want something. Your customers obviously are, are, are the most important. So you look at all of that, and then you're looking at saying, how do I lead, what do I prioritize? And this is where your own convictions and beliefs as a leader are fundamentally important. And sometimes leaders make the mistake of ignoring, ignoring one or two of these important stakeholders. You know, in the US you see how many CEOs get fired because many times they misread the board. They misread what the key investor expected of them. Right? In family-owned businesses, you misunderstand or under-recognize the expectation of your father or of your brother or sister and so on, and you get into trouble and so forth. So it's important to understand in your context, you know, who are those stakeholders that you should really care about? What are their expectations? What of those you will honor? What of those you will ignore? And what are your own convictions about how you want to lead the business? Seventh, building a high-performing team. Now, building a high-performing team is often a cliche. You know, of course, everybody should build a high-performing team, but I would question to start Sorry, I think that's, yeah, the, on the right-hand side. I would question to start, what is the role of the team? In most organizations that I have been to, I find that teams at the top are just working groups. They're not really teams. You know, they come together to set some policies, exchange some information, but often, more often than not, the decision-making doesn't really happen in teams, and I don't even know if it should happen in teams. Uh, so it's very important to reflect on what is it that we want this team to do? What is the purpose of this team? Second, is the composition of the team. You know, even one, two, three bad characters in the team can spoil the entire sport. I've seen it is often the lack of trust, interpersonal dynamics, and not having the right person in the right place can make a huge, huge problem for the whole team. And finally, it's the effectiveness of the team. To me, an effective team is one that is aligned, aligned on the direction of the business, that is aligned on what it takes to win, and that has high quality of interaction where people can constructively challenge, debate, agree to disagree, but then once they make a decision, stick with it. So I think there's a lot to be said about as leaders, how do you build that high-performing team? And finally, I want to finish by coming back to how do you unlock the drive in people? I think, I don't know if you've read Daniel Pink, I think he's, he's one of my favorite authors. He, he wrote a book called Drive, and where he analyzes what is it that causes certain executives, certain leaders to have unbelievable drive. And I think you, the core argument he makes is the carrot and stick approach can only be a hygiene. It can never really result in exceptional drive in people. And if you want to create that drive and ambition, you have to look at three things. One is autonomy. You know, how do you create the space for people to feel like they're in charge of what they can do? Second is mastery. You know, how do you give people the ability to pursue in some shape or form something that they want to be good at, the, the kick and joy they get out of personal development? And finally, how do you give people a sense of purpose? You know, there's a famous saying where somebody was laying bricks and you know, there were three people. One guy said, look, I'm just hammering a rock. The other one said, I'm, I'm shaping a block. And the third one said, I'm building a cathedral. They're all doing the same thing. But they feel very differently about what they're doing. And how do you get more and more people in the organization to feel like I'm building a cathedral, not like hammering a rock? So I'd just like to close on that note. I think I could spend a lot more time on these issues, but to summarize, I think we're living in very, very fast-changing world. I think our sense is the next 30 years is going to be 100 times faster than the Industrial Revolution was. 
I think disruptive forces will impact how the world evolves. I talked about five of them. I talked about uh, the emerging markets, urbanization, technology, aging world, and some of the global shocks. I talked briefly about what are some of the big level implications for businesses, you know, choosing where to compete, thinking about digital, agility in the organization. And then finally, I talked a little bit about what do you need to be thinking about as a leader. On that note, I'd, I'd like to close, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be here. Thank you, Mr. Gautam, for that uh, very insightful address. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. R. Sitaram is the Chief Executive Officer of Doha Bank. He's a prominent personality in the banking industry throughout the Middle East, an economic expert who has achieved remarkable success for his contributions to banking, trade, investment, economics, environment, social responsibility, philanthropy, and charity. He's been named the best CEO in Middle East for three times in the last 10 years and world leader business person. He's also received the Businessman of the Year Award in 2015 from Qatar Today and also been conferred with the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Banker Middle East in May 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to invite our guest of honor, Dr. R. C. Taraman, to deliver this special address. Distinguished guests, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and privilege to be an integral part of this annual convention of the Madras Management Association. The earlier speakers have set in the right kind of tone for me to take it from there. As a practitioner, leading a, a financial institution, living abroad for over 30 years, I think the topic, a leading change, has come at a very defining moment. To understand the dynamics of this concept, perhaps I have to run in the next 15 minutes, prorating each section for five minutes to understand what's happening on the global governance. That's the substance Gautam has already set in the right kind of fine tone. What's happening in the corporate governance should be the next agenda. And finally, how you should drive the change, lead the change to sustain your credibility. We recognize the world is changing. We recognize we have to change with that. Even after seven years of financial crisis, our global growth, if you look at it, it's not sustainable. It's less than 2009. Financial economies are converting as real. Real economies are redefining the scope and performance. Communism has changed. Capitalism is altercating its form and substance. Mixed economies are uh, redefining the scope. Extraordinary set of deliberations. G7 has become G8, G8 has become a G20. What we once, once conceived as a liquid issue has moved into a funding crisis, funding crisis moved into a solvency issue. Today, it is a sovereign issue. Politics and economics is not converging, even though it is inclusive in substance, execution is still wanted. Unless we set universal standard in terms of accounting, valuations, securitizations, global growth is not sustainable. While we set in the right kind of mission as Millennium Development Goals, it was redefined in September 2015 as Sustainable Development Goal. The reason being, global growth is not sustaining its credibility. In aggregate terms, if you look at developed world and developing world, it's just likely to score between 3 to 3.1 percent. Advanced economies still underperforming. Developing economies, if you look at emerging markets, India, as everyone is predicting in core economic terms, it's a balanced scorecard says India is going to be the top performer, between 7 to 7.5 percent. America is said to be recovering. It's a premature a decision to raise the interest rates. We have clearly seen deceleration has taken place enormously in the financial markets. Stock market is a carnage throughout the last one and a half months. No single market, right from NASDAQ to Dow Jones to Japanese Nikkei, no single market, including Nifty, is in, in the green zone. It's not confined to stock market alone. 
looking at the commodity prices when dollar was strengthening, oil futures were the right reflection of unlocking those hedges today. If you look at whether it is oil or any other commodity, today it's in downward trend. Possibly the dumping could be the major manufacturer's plot. Extraordinary set of changes in terms of the currency market. When you realize the global economy needs to be pumped up with liquidity, we realize we need to put additional money on the table. The hot money, trillions of dollars, were pumped chasing the stock market, commodity market, currency market, property market in specific terms. But today, if you look at the reflection, the entire financial market is a gambling ground. It's not an exaggeration. Look at the, the changing dynamics in real order. Commodities economies today are completely under the water. When dollar was over, rather, uh, oil was over $100, it was purely speculation. It's not the demand and supply factor alone. When dollar is weak, you had the risk by buying commodity futures that was reflecting the oil-based economies where I come from, where 45% of the world oil, 20, 25% of the world gas come from. We have realized we have to eradicate extreme poverty. We have realized we have to bring in gender equality. We have realized we have to bring in universal education. We also realize you have to bring in maternal health care and again child mortality we need to fix. More than anything else, it is not economics, it is economics, economics in convergence of ecology and economics in direct terms to sustain. The world at large has to contain environment sustainability as a major driver. Otherwise, global warming and climate change can decimate this planet. That's the level of threat we are seeing. That's precisely the reason why the sustainable development goal was set in in September last year. This is a global scene. Within the definition of the global financial space, India is scoring as a functional democracy. We are scoring well, but it remains to be seen. Can we produce gross welfare to the mass? Can we bridge the gap between haves and have nots? Can we make sure our economic performance is going to be sustainable. We are proud of our heritage, value systems, culture, civilizations. It transcended borders. Indians have transcended every part of the world. The food is transcended. The culture is transcended. Festivals are transcended. Your literature is transcended. Your cinema is transcended. There's no question about it. Today, India is globalizing in true suspense. Clearly, the brand equity which the new government brought in, extraordinary to be a proud Indian. Econometrics, again, will tell you this century belongs to India. That's what Mr. Gautam was trying to articulate in substance. But what we need to articulate is a set of governance which are transparent, a set of governance which are ethically, morally governing and consensus in terms of politics and economics. While market liberalization has been a well-laid-out principles to make sure free market principles, even China was a telling story, only by, by economics precedes politics. Even though it's a socialistic nation, it was setting a vision convergence in real order to see free market dynamics operates. That's why America was converging with China. Today's economy, Indian economy, is in the right direction. Our market liberalization is working in the right direction. Our investments is going in the right direction. Our foreign direct investments is rightly growing. Our remittances, our inward remittances, is, is said to be in the right momentum. But what we need to articulate is policy decisions which are converging in terms of economics and sustainable economics more than anything else. That's the need of the hub. Financial markets today are completely unpredictable. But how do you govern it? How do you sustain the value system to see the corporate boardrooms are committed for transparency and ensuring diversity comes in in terms of decision making? How do we make sure principle centered value systems are not compromised? How do we make sure we have absolute financial disclosure which governs to set to universal standards? Then we are going to see leaders are emerging for sustainable growth model. Then we are going to see we are converging in line with the global prediction, India is going to sustain its credibility as a good nation. That's the need of the hover. But how do you drive the change? You as a leader, you as a performer, how do you drive the change? You have to set in a long-term vision. 
And no individual can be a good person unless he has got committed long-term vision. Today's world, unfortunately, is short-term driven. When it, there's a say, there's an oriental say, if you aim for one year, perhaps you can produce flowers. If you aim for 10 years, perhaps you can produce trees. If your vision is eternity, then you build humanity, human dignity. And that's what is important when it comes to corporate management. Recognizing wealth without work, science without humanity, politics without principles, religion without sacrifice, consciousness is vital for pleasure. All these things are synchronized model for you to converge to make sure you as, as a driver of the leadership, as an engine of the institution, come to terms. Unless you are integrating your heart and mind, socially responsible, you cannot produce a good institution. And that's what Sri Ram is all about. The proud to be a, an institution of character and commitment. Institutions without such character, it's not only shareholders. Mr. Gautam was, I was carefully listening to the dictums. It's shareholders. The typical financial institutions like us, it is not, it's not only shareholders. More than the shareholders' money, a good government institutions can take eight to nine times as public deposits, seven to eight times as lending. So what requires, what is at stake is to recognize you have social responsibility, which is vital. Ensuring your consumers are protected. With the change in global scene, whether you run a private enterprise, whether you run a local enterprise, it is global, it is public. Unless you take care of shareholders, customers, regulators, and the society at large, if you don't have corporate social responsibility, you don't govern. You don't earn the trust and honesty of the consumers as well as the shareholders. So driving the change with the brand equity, building a character is important. Reputation, perhaps once or twice, you attempt, you may get it. Sustaining as a good character, as an institution, comes out of deep-rooted dive. And deep dive will give you enough instinct for you to make sure all the stakeholders are listened to. With the changing dynamics in technology, changing business trends in market acquisitions, economic value advantage, we also see the change in terms of technology. Business process outsourcing, knowledge process outsourcing are not ordinary issues today. The world is borderless today. Territorial integrity is meaningless. It's one world. You are all global citizens. Unless you devise a business model, which is global, unless you make sure every bit of rationalization comes in, a cost of revenue is distinctly portrayed as a global business model, you are not competitive enough. You are not competitive enough. That's what we need to realize. It's a question of recognition of the fact with changing business, changing technology trends are driving the change for 24 by 7 and ensuring your service standards are set for universal standards. And then only you can sustain, you can reach the top, but yes, can you sustain your market share? Can you make sure you produce the returns in a sustainable form and substance? Can you? Then you mean something. Digital advantage today is an extraordinary tool. People are not location-centric, they are information-centric. People are not product-centric, they are consumer-centric. Unless you diversify, aggregate, and customize solutions, you are not going to get the value advantage for any business. That's the need of the hour. Recognition is a fact. Social media listening is equally important. Your reputation can be tarnished in no time. Classic story is this, this week, Deutsche Bank. Five years before anyone asked me about Deutsche Bank, I sent even my executives to have enterprise risk management sessions through Deutsche. It was totally tarnished. The image was tarnished a week before when they were trying to disclose their off-balance sheet securitizations. The institution lost 40% market capitalization two days till the top management came to rescue saying that we will go for a bond issue. Recognition of the fact that they have to submit in transparent terms all the analytics so that it can be globally audited. Then the stock market was recovering. Today, the, the social media is a tool which you can recognize, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. These are telling stories for you to set your reputation with a long-term commitment, ensuring transparency, and the leadership is there to drive the change. So what you need to do is to have a differentiated strategy, ensuring you prepare f people for grooming them for global environment, ensuring you recognize uh, distinctions in your 
selling propositions and strategize them to see your risks are mitigated, mapped. It could be, it could be compliance or audit. That's value at risk history. Today, integrated stakeholders value is the real risk mapping. If you understand these dynamics in all sense, you become a leader. Leadership is within you to self-govern to start with. Drive and determination will come. Once you aim at sustainability in real order, the value streaming will take, will speak in global terms that you are a performer, articulate enough to see you aim at global concurrence for your products and services, universal endorsement for your leadership. And that's what I perceive as the change. That's what I believe as a leadership trait. That's what I believe in building, whether you run a small enterprise or a big enterprise, it's a partnership where all the stakeholders, it's like running your own house, creating gross welfare and making sure every integral part of the components is equally coming to terms in, when it comes to shared vision and shared leadership. Institution corporate management is not distinct from the family management. Country's management is not different from what you perceive in terms of shared vision and shared leadership. That's what needed the hover. Leaders can drive the change. The change has to be accepted universally by one and all of all the stakeholders. Then you build your house, you build your country, and you build a continent, you build the nations. A good person can produce a good house. A group of good people can produce good corporate. A group of good corporate can create a good nation. A group of good nations can produce United Nations. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Sita Raman, for that very thought-provoking and inspiring address. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause to our guest of honor. Thank you very much, sir. I now call upon Group Captain R. Vijay Kumar, Executive Director, to brief us on Executive Director of Madras Management Association to brief us on the convention special issue of the business mandate. Thank you, Prakash. Uh, it's, it's indeed my proud privilege. Uh, tenth year, we are releasing this special issue of business mandate on the tenth convention. But before I thought I'll do, I have another pleasant job to do that, and I'm really delighted to do that. Uh, you all know President mentioned the welcome address that we'll be moving to our new place soon uh, during the Diamond Jubilee year of MMA, a state of art, a green, platinum rated uh, MMA house constructed about 22,000 square foot. You always be wondering uh, how it's going to look because uh, we always, when you construct a house, uh, you plan and you dream, and that's what we are doing in MMA, the committee and the, the team is really dreaming how to present. I thought I'm going to showcase to you what the MMA was going to look like. At. May I have the MMA house slide, please? This is how the MMA house is going to be look for you. And uh, it will be a state of art uh, green red building. It will have a boardroom, it will have a state of art good lecture hall, libraries, and research room. We want to make it really the best place for the management in Chennai. Okay? Be a part of history, be there, to be enjoying there. It will be soon ready for you. Now, MMA eagerly comes out with the uh, in-house uh, news magazine amongst the management fraternity. It's called Business Mandate. I'm indeed, as I mentioned, privileged to do it uh, uh, for the last so many years. Uh, it's a wonderful endorsement of the hard work and dedication of the team MMA that